The framework I found, which made the decision incredibly easy, was a, what, what I called, which only a nerd would call, a regret minimization framework. Hi, I'm Justin. Nice to meet you. That's Jeff Bezos, talking about how he decided to quit his job at D.E. Shaw and start Amazon. Today, we'll set out on a journey through the mathematics of regret minimization. Our reward will be an optimal algorithm called Follow the Regularized Leader, which has numerous applications. The material might take some time to digest. I would treat it like six lectures in a graduate course or 120 pages in a graduate textbook. Feel free to make yourself comfortable, pause whenever you want, and ask questions in the comments. I've also put a more rigorous treatment in the description. With that out of the way, let's talk about the strange thing known as regret. I'm sure we've all experienced a regret in our day-to-day -day lives. I want to point out some characteristics that translate to mathematical regret. First, regret comes after an action. You're faced with a scenario, you take a course of action, and you may later regret your decision. It's sequential. And second, regret occurs because we can't see the future. If you could see all possible futures, you could take the best possible course of action and not have any regrets. But seeing the future is easier said than done. And even when time passes and you look back with hindsight, you can only see the consequences of the action you took and speculate about other outcomes. That speculation might be subject to biases, such as thinking the grass is greener on the other side. But we'll show that specific bias to be mathematically optimal. Third, we can learn from regret. Consequence teaches us about what we value and how to avoid future regrets, which helps us do better in similar situations in the future. Now let's play a game. Let cap t and cap s be positive integers, and let y be a real number. I say cap t and cap s to distinguish from the lowercase t and s. Let c be a non-empty compact convex set of cap s dimensional vectors, and equip c with the l star norm. For each of the game's cap t rounds, which are also frequently referred to as days, Alice will pick an action a sub t and c after which fate is going to design and reveal a convex Y-Lipschitz function k sub t from c to the real numbers. Next, Alice will incur a net loss, and this will be the sum of the losses from each round. After the game finishes, Bob will find the single action b and c that minimizes net loss. And by the way, the only reason I included the non-empty compactness is to guarantee that b exists through the extreme value theorem. We can define regret as Alice's net loss minus Bob's net loss. Now fate is omniscient and designs each loss function to maximize regret. In other words, fate automatically knows what strategy Alice will use, what actions she'll take in response to any loss functions, and how best to counter anything she does. So we want to figure out a strategy for Alice, some way for her to compute each action a sub t based on the parameters of the game and the previous revealed loss functions. So basically, it's Alice's diversity of actions versus Bob's ability to see the future and fate's omniscient control over the loss functions. But it's still a really abstract math problem. Even if we do find an optimal algorithm for regret, would it have any real life applications? It does. Our strategy for Alice is so general and so versatile that special cases include stochastic gradient descent, adaptive boosting and portfolio allocation, and a multi-armed bandits approach widely used for personalized content. And as you just saw, Amazon wouldn't exist without it. Now, the downside of this generality is that reasoning about such broad concepts is difficult. So let's try and understand the problem. You might notice my use of colons as sequences in addition to naming functions. And this use of sequences is inspired by the Python programming language. There's a lot of math terms like convex and compact we say that C is a convex set if for any two points in C, the line segment connecting them is also in C. We say that C is compact if it contains its boundary and can be enclosed by a finite ball. So let's look at some examples. I'm going to translate these definitions to shapes. This is the set x squared plus y squared is less than 1. And I'm going to say whether this set is convex, whether it's compact, and whether it's non-empty. Feel free to pause and think about it yourself. So this set is convex and non-empty, but it's not compact because it doesn't contain its boundary. You can notice the dashed line. 
Next example, this is the set 2x squared is less than or equal to y, which is less than or equal to x squared plus 1. Feel free to pause. So this set is compact and non-empty, but it's not convex because the line segment between negative 1, 2 and 1, 2 goes outside the shape. Next example. So this is x is less than x, which is a contradiction, so the solutions form the empty set. Feel free to pause. This set is compact and convex, surprisingly, but it's empty because the equation has no solutions, so it's not non-empty. Okay, now here's a fun one. Here's the set x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 4, and y is at least negative 1. Feel free to pause. So this set is compact, convex, and non-empty. So an instance of the game could have Alice picking a point in this set. And I want to cover two more definitions. First, we say that any function r is x strongly convex when it has a quadratic lower bound with double derivative x. And we say that r is convex when it has a linear lower bound. So when you hear strongly convex, think of an upward parabola. And when you hear convex, think of a line. Second, we say that any function h is y Lipschitz when its slope is at most y. Since holes and jumps have ill-defined slopes, this Lipschitz condition also implies that the loss functions are continuous. Essentially, convexity prevents fate from saying, every action is great except for the point that you picked. And Lipschitz continuity prevents fate from saying, every action is terrible, except for this one arbitrary point that you didn't pick. So now that we've covered all the definitions, let's make a simpler class of loss functions to reason about. I call them unit inner products because they take the inner product of an action in C, then they multiply it by a unit loss vector, u sub t. So note that a unit loss vector is not necessarily a unit vector. Each component of the unit loss vector is in negative 1, 1, but the overall length might be larger than 1. Now, the cool thing about unit inner products is that they're linear transformations. So this makes them convex 1 Lipschitz in L1 and square root S Lipschitz in L2, although if you prove the last result, you'll need to finagle with the cauchy schwartz inequality. And therefore, unit inner products are valid loss functions. Moving forward, we only care that a norm generalizes the distance from the origin in higher dimensions. The slope y varies depending upon the norm. So you can be y Lipschitz in one norm and a different y Lipschitz in another norm. The L1 norm is measured by only traveling parallel to axes, while the L2 norm is measured along a straight line. So in this 3, 4, 5 triangle, you can see that the L1 norm is 4 plus 3 equals 7, and the L2 norm is 3 squared plus 4 squared square rooted, which is 5. Now, let's set up a simple version of this game. First, let C be the two-dimensional probability simplex. In other words, it's the set of all two-dimensional probability vectors. And we're going to equip it with the L1 norm. Next, suppose for simplicity that fate only chooses unit inner products as loss functions. For convenience, we're also going to define the net loss vectors cap u sub t and the net loss functions cap k sub t. Let's tell Alice to use a simple strategy known as follow the leader or FTL. Alice will pick the single action that minimizes the sum of all previous loss functions. The implicit assumption is that what would have worked best in the past is what's going to work best now. And Alice is going to basically try and copy Bob's strategy, but without his ability to see the future. And although we're only going to test FTL on one example, it can be applied to any game. If you do the math, you see that the net loss function for each round is just the inner product of that round's action with the net loss vector of that round. And this is because inner products are distributive. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't take much for fate to defeat FTL. Fate responds with the following unit loss vectors. And if you do the math, you can see that this forces FTL to just alternate between 0, 1 and 1, 0. And that's not a good sign. I want to demonstrate the results of FTL in a video. Feel free to play along. Pause as much as you need to. If you don't remember anything from the previous slide, that's actually a good thing. It means you're in the same boat as Alice, who doesn't know fate's plans. 
Just remember, you can't change your pick once the numbers are revealed, and you want to pick low numbers so you have a low net score, just like in golf. So as you can see, FTL does terribly on this instance. Alice made the worst possible decisions, leading to a regret of T if the game had continued onward. And since we can make regret arbitrarily large by making T arbitrarily large, this hints that the best possible strategy would be an algorithm for asymptotically sublinear regret in T. Keep in mind that FTL only failed here because we designed an adversarial set of losses. If fate wasn't an omniscient adversary, you could use FTL and probably do just fine. So here's an interesting idea. What if we gave Alice one round of foresight and had her pick what works best for the upcoming round and all previous rounds? This yields be the leader or BTL. And notice that BTL is by definition what Bob would do if he played for the first T rounds instead of the whole game with cap T rounds. Essentially, we're considering a hypothetical where Alice is still imitating Bob, but instead of seeing zero rounds in advance, she sees one round in advance. Surprisingly, this one round difference is all it takes to achieve non-positive regret, which we will show by induction on the claim that BTL never does worse than Bob in terms of net loss. Base case, start at round one, they do the same thing. Inductive hypothesis, you assume that BTL is beating Bob for the first T rounds. For the inductive step, you add the T plus one round on both sides. And BTL will beat Bob for T plus one rounds because whatever Alice does on round T plus one is by definition what Bob would have wanted to do. So BTL's loss is at most Bob's loss and it has a non-positive regret. So we've covered a lot of ground so far. To refresh, here's a glossary. The main takeaway from the last few slides is that the one round difference between FTL and BTL has huge consequences. FTL is a valid algorithm for Alice, but it had poor performance in the game we tested it on. And BTL is invalid, but it has great performance and beats Bob. Keep in mind that it's invalid because Alice can't see into the future at all. From a machine learning perspective, the problem is that FTL overfits, going to extremes in order to get the best possible fit. But another way to think about it might be through a story. So let's say you have team FTL and has a brilliant leader called BTL. BTL's on top of every trend. They know exactly what projects to pursue, exactly what deals to sign, exactly what moves to make. Unfortunately, they're so fast-paced that nobody else on the team can catch up with them. Every meeting has a new plan and a new project. Deadlines are impossible to meet. The team is so stretched that long-term priorities fall to the wayside. Now, team FTRL has a less brilliant leader called BTRL. BTRL moves more slowly than BTL and would lose in any one-on-one -on -one competition. But BTRL is more regular and more stable. They're a good leader. They catch people up. And when the whole team moves, it actually moves faster than the other team because everyone's nearly on the same page. I think most of us would prefer the second team. Now the R in FTRL and BTRL stands for regularization which is exactly how we'll fix the problem with FTL. Now let's look at a practical demonstration. The mirror represents the net loss function, which changes as fate throws in new loss functions. The light denotes the boundary of the convex set C that players pick actions from. The marble represents FTL, and the lowest point on the mirror represents BTL. And a problem, which you probably just noticed, is that it's entirely possible for FTL to fly out of C in practical applications. We'll now add a bowl, which represents a regularizer. You can see that the bowl improves the stability of FTL, and it prevents the marble from flying out, although the lowest point on the bowl has some cracking error when compared to the lowest point on the mirror. Now let's go back to the mathematics. So we want to mimic the effects of the bowl. And how we're going to do that is through the learning rate, which is a positive real number eta, and a regularizer, a continuous one strongly convex function r from c to the real numbers. We turn follow the leader, or FTL, into the follow the regularized leader, or FTRL. 
we turn B the later or BTL into B the regularized leader or BTRL. And we do so by adding the regularizer divided by the learning rate, which you might consider a diversity bonus. This makes FTRL and BTRL 1 over eta strongly convex functions because when you add up convex functions, they stay convex. In other words, eta is a hyperparameter that lets us tune the convexity. Now you might wonder, does a regularizer always exist? Yes, you can always just do the norm of b squared divided by 2 for any input b. Now to analyze FTRL, we're first going to analyze BTRL. We'll show that BTRL is a little worse than BTL, and I'm going to do that in three steps. The trick, which took me a while to wrap my head around, is to imagine that r over eta isn't just some random term we threw in. It can actually be treated like the loss function for a fake round zero. And this is perfect because remember, FTL is just one round away from BTL, and bridging that gap would get us the great performance of BTL to an extent. So the loss of BTRL from round one is just the loss of BTL starting from round zero, but you avoid the loss from round zero because it's a fake round. And the loss of BTL from round zero is at most the loss of Bob if he started from round zero, since BTL always has no regret and never loses to Bob as we showed earlier. So the loss of Bob from round zero is an upper bound on the loss of BTRL plus the min of R over eta, which is what loss was avoided on round zero. Now, Bob from round zero has to account for round zero in minimizing the net sum by picking a single action. So let's say he just ignored round zero and focused on minimizing round one to cap T, like normal Bob. Well, at worst, he would incur the maximum possible loss on round zero, which is R over eta's maximum value. And then for the rest of the rounds, he'd do the same thing as normal Bob and get the corresponding net loss. So we just proved the three outline statements. Let's add them all up. We get that min r over eta plus the loss of BTRL is at most max r over eta plus Bob's loss. If we define the range of r over c as the max value of r for b and c minus the min value of r for b and c, we get that the regret of BTRL, which is the loss of BTRL minus Bob's loss, is at most the range of R over C divided by eta. Now that we've bounded BTRL, let's bound FTRL with respect to BTRL. You get that the difference in regret is the sum of the differences between FTRL's loss and BTRL's loss for each of the cap T rounds, and we can call this term instability. Note that Alice's action by FTRL on round T plus one is the same as her action on by BTRL on round t, as FTRL and BTRL are again just off by one round. So now let's figure out how to bound that instability term. Here's a neat little theorem which I'll call close convex minima. It states that x strongly convex functions f and g with a y Lipschitz difference have minima separated by at most y over x in their given norm. We can apply close convex minima with x equal 1 over eta, y equals y, f being ftrl, and g being btrl, or ftrl plus 1 day. Note that h equals g minus f is y Lipschitz because it turns out to be k sub t, which is y Lipschitz by our original definition of loss functions. As a result, we get that y times eta is at least the norm of FTRL's action on round t minus FTRL's action on round t plus 1. Again, we're going to use the fact that k sub t is y Lipschitz. You get that y squared eta is at least FTRL's loss on day t minus FTRL's loss on round t if it played the action from round t plus 1. The instability term is therefore at most t y squared eta. So let's summarize what we've done so far. We've bounded the regret of BTRL. We've defined instability as the difference in regret of FTRL and the regret of BTRL, and we've bounded instability. If we add all three expressions, you get that the regret of FTRL is at most range of R over C divided by eta plus T Y squared eta. When you use the inequality of arithmetic and geometric means, also known as AMGM, 
you can pick the value of eta that minimizes regret. We pick the optimal learning rate for FTRL, which is square root of range R over C over Y square root cap T. And that means that the regret of FTRL is at most 2Y square root T times the range of R over C. And this is great because as R increases, the average regret per round will converge to zero. So to summarize, Alice is playing a repeated game where she picks actions, fate designs loss functions to trip her up, and she wants to minimize regret while comparing herself to Bob, who picks a single best action because he can see the future. Her strategy is to first find a one strongly convex regularizer. We always have this really useful default, which is the norm of b squared over 2. Next, Alice is going to compute the learning rate eta. Then she's going to play according to FTRL, which minimizes the previous net loss function plus R over eta. Due to the extreme value theorem and the nature of strongly convex functions, there always exists a single finite action that minimizes FTRL. However, efficiently computing that action can be difficult. Let's apply this to a classic setup, which yields gradient descent. So let the radius rho be a positive real number and make C a ball centered at the origin with radius rho. And let's say fate uses unit inner products for loss functions. By our earlier results, each loss function is square root cap S Lipschitz. We can use the default regularizer and get a range of rho squared over two. Now we get a learning rate eta equal to rho over square root two cap S cap T. That yields a regret of rho square root two cap S cap T, which is great. Now, if you want a closed form for what Alice should play, you can just take the derivative and find where the slope equals zero, which is the minimum. And you get that a sub t is just negative eta times the previous loss vector, or cap u sub t minus one. Of course, there is a caveat. Gradient descent sometimes ends up outside of the ball we defined earlier. Sometimes you might see a gradient explode to infinity. So we need this precondition, which is that the net loss vectors never get too extreme and go outside the ball at any step. Now, if each round or sample in online gradient descent arrives chronologically, or, and the timing matters because the environment is changing, this yields online gradient descent. And a more popular approach is to randomize the order in which samples are presented when there is no intrinsic temporal component. That would yield stochastic gradient descent. Radiant descent has played a role in many deep neural networks, from DeepMind's AlphaGo and AlphaFold to OpenAI's transformer models to Stockfish for playing chess. Now let's think about a different setting known as prediction from expert advice. Instead of a ball, we'll have a probability simplex equipped with the L1 norm like earlier. We'll still use unit inner products, which are one Lipschitz but we're going to use a custom regularizer, the sum of BS ln BS for S in one seek cap S. Now you might notice that zero ln zero is a bit questionable to define. So you can imagine that we shrink our action space C by a tiny amount. We essentially want each component to be at least three to the negative E to the negative three ST divided by a huge number like nine factorial, 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 which is bigger than the number of Planck volumes in the observable universe. This yields a range of ln cap s. We get that eta equals square root ln cap s divided by square root t. And we get that the regret of FTRL is at most two square root cap t ln cap s. And you might be asking yourself, why should we care about this situation? Well, if you're playing a game, any finite game with cap s pure actions, then any mixed strategy would be a probability vector in the s-dimensional simplex we just defined. And FTRL would give you a good strategy for any such game, such as rock, paper, scissors, or prisoner's dilemma. So surprisingly, FTRL is so powerful that as a result of this, you can use its existence to prove the existence of Nash equilibria in finite games. Or in other words, just the very presence of FTRL implies Nash equilibria. So let's say you have some finite number of Alice's against each other in some finite competitive game. If the game repeats cap t times and all players use FTRL to learn how to play, 
their regret per round will go towards zero as cap t goes towards infinity. And that means each Alice is becoming like a Bob, picking the single best action when holding all other players fixed. That means no player can deviate and improve their score, forming a Nash equilibrium that can be explicitly computed by taking the mean of each Alice's actions. And from this, you can actually also prove von Neumann's minimax theorem, which yields the strong duality of linear programs. The regularizer is inspired by negative entropy, which comes from the famous formulation of Boltzmann entropy by Josiah Willard Gibbs. Now let's try and find a closed form solution. Although we would like to find the minimum by checking for a slope of zero, we can't take the derivative directly in this case because that would allow solutions that fall outside the probability simplex. Instead, we'll need to use a method called Lagrangian multipliers to convert the expression to a Lagrangian function. And then you can take the derivative and solve to get your answer, but I've left out those details. So values called weights are found by exponentiating negative eta times the net loss vectors. And for each round, the strategy is to take each previous weight and divide it by the sum of all previous weights. Since the weights are positive, they never fall outside the simplex. And this yields the multiplicative weights update algorithm, also known as weighted majority, or the hedge algorithm. And if you're wondering, that's the same hedge as hedge funds, like the one that Jeff Bezos worked at. And another famous example of this algorithm is adaptive boosting where each pure strategy is an algorithm, and you use FTRL to combine an ensemble of algorithms. And finally, you might see parallels to indices like the S&P 500, which give greater weight to stocks with higher market cap while not discarding any particular stock and overall maintaining a diverse portfolio. Unfortunately, the multiplicative weight updates algorithm doesn't work well in real life markets, first because of transaction fees, and second because we are making the assumption that the markets are hostile and out to get you. Now, in real life, sometimes you can't play a mixed strategy. Let's say you're deciding on what school to go to, what field to study in, what job offer to accept, or who to spend time with. Whatever you decide, it's almost impossible to visualize what the other outcome would have been. You only get to see the outcome of the path you chose. This is analogous to the multi-armed bandits problem proposed by Herbert Robbins in 1952, and it has some parallels to our original game. So Alice faces cap S slot machines over cap T rounds. Before each round, fate will set each machine's payout to some value. For each round, Alice can use a random number generator hidden to fate and pull one machine. And Alice only learns one thing each round, which is the payout of the machine that she pulled. So the other machine's outcomes are hidden to her, unlike in the previous example with FTRL and negative entropy. So our question is, can Alice match the payouts of the best machine, which is what Bob would have pulled the whole time? And the reason why it's called the multi-armed bandits problem is because slot machines are individually known as one-armed bandits. And we can't apply FTRL with negative entropy directly because we only get to see the payout of the machine pulled, and not the payouts of every machine for that round. So the trick to solving multi-armed bandits is to estimate the losses of the other outcomes, the paths we didn't choose to take or the arms we didn't pull. And although there are many ways to estimate these losses, the most straightforward is to simply assume the grass is greener on the other side. For the arms we didn't pull, we assume a loss of zero, which is pretty good. For the arm we did pull, we treat the estimated loss as the actual payout divided by the probability with which we pulled it. This amplifies losses and gains by the chance you would have done it. If you do something that you initially assigned a low probability, you're going to pay attention to it more. It's going to change your behavior more. So everyday things won't change your behavior that much, but if you do something unfamiliar, something you really normally wouldn't do, the outcome can really influence how you think about avoiding regret in the future. So this encourages a lot of exploration at the beginning, seeing if the grass is greener on the other side. And then later on, you settle down and exploit the strategy that works best according to your experience. Now, the expected values of the estimated losses given a sub t are actually really straightforward to compute, and they form this nifty set of properties. Yeah.
If you use the law of total expectation, we can add another nifty property. Use it again and you get an interesting result. Alice's expected loss with the estimated unit losses is the same as her expected loss with the real unit losses. So in other words, playing according to estimated losses is on average as good as playing according to the real losses. The only issue is the variance in the estimator, which we'll touch on later. Now we're going to use the Taylor series formulas below and do a little bit of algebra. We get that the regret is at most ln cap s over eta plus eta over 2 times the sum of every expected value of a sub t s times e sub t s squared. And if we use the fourth nifty property from earlier, we get that each expected value term is equal to u sub t s squared. That means regret is at most ln cap s over eta plus eta over 2 times cap t times cap s. And if we use the AMGM inequality again, we get that eta is square root of 2 ln cap s over cap t times cap s. Note that for cap s greater than 2, our learning rate is lower than in the full information scenario where we could see all the payouts. And in other words, we regularize more heavily and have a slower learning rate, which makes sense when less information is available. The higher regret is also to be expected because Alice has cap s times less information per round. Additionally, this higher variance from the estimator means that the regret bound is only expected. So on individual runs, Alice could actually do much worse than these bounds. Now, FTRL with negative entropy and estimated losses is known as the Exponential Weight Algorithm for Exploration and Exploitation, or EXP3. If you throw in expert advice, you get EXP4, which is really useful for learning user preferences for personalized content. So let's say you were recommended this video by YouTube. YouTube has an ensemble of algorithms, maybe one recommending math videos, maybe one recommending cute cat videos, and so forth. And that leads to the next suggested video. Now initially, each expert per profile is initially weighted. So based on the payout, which will be how much you pay attention to the video, YouTube will start weighing some experts over other experts. Google Ads, Facebook, Netflix, and Spotify also use systems based on FTRL. So big question is, can we do better than FTRL? Well, there are a few ways. First, we can vary the learning rate. There's a doubling trick you can use that means you don't need to use cap T in advance. We guess that cap T is one, and we double cap T whenever we reach our estimate, recalculating the learning rate as we go. And there are more sophisticated learning rate schedules like Adagrad, RMS Prop, and Atom. Another way to improve is to use some domain knowledge. If there's a certain property of the loss functions, contextual data, or some kind of internal structure for the game, we can put that in, and might, maybe that will yield a better algorithm. However, something really interesting is that the O square root cap T dependence of FTRL is unbeatable, and that means that learning is O of square root cap T in a competitive environment, no matter what. Remember our game from earlier, where fate alternated so that FTL achieved the worst possible performance? We can use the same game with one tiny modification to create the worst possible regret for Alice. Instead of alternating, fate will just flip a coin every round. If heads, the unit loss vector is 0, 0,1. And if the coin lands tails, the unit loss vector is 1, 0. So here's what the example unit losses might look like. Although there might appear to be a pattern, I generated these flips with the most random means available to me. So any potential flags or patterns are just there to trick us. Any strategy Alice uses would incur a loss of cap t over 2 on this random sequence. However, Bob can see the future, and he'll know how many heads and how many tails there are, so he'll pick the option that minimizes his loss. Therefore, if m heads and cap t minus m tails occur, Alice's regret would be the absolute value of m minus cap t over 2. We can then calculate the expected regret by summing up the probability of each number of heads occurring multiplied by the expected regret given that number of heads occurring. Let's use two identities to simplify that expression. The first identity is on the left, and the second identity is to take care of that sum. Again, we start by proving the base case and assuming the inductive hypothesis. 
Then we add the terms to both sides that would perform the inductive step and we find it to be true. So it turns out now we can just use those two identities. And if we apply them to the earlier expression for the expected regret, we get that the expected regret is one over two to the cap T times cap G choose cap M plus one, all multiplied by cap M plus one. And in this case, cap M is equal to the floor of cap T minus one over two. And for this algebra, what we're doing is we essentially take that initial sum, stop at cap M, because that's the halfway point, cut it in half, and then essentially use that symmetry to simplify a bit. We now can simplify further. We do that with Sterling's formula, specifically a version derived by Herbert Robbins in 1955. By the way, that's the same Herbert Robbins who thought of the multi-armed bandits problem. We get a pretty good approximation, and then we get that the expected regret is at least the square root of cap t minus 1 divided by a constant. Now I plot our re expected regret and a lower bound, which is O of square root cap t. And this shows that you can't do any better than FTRL in an asymptotic sense, because fate flipping coins is unbeatable in this instance. Surprisingly, fate completely ignores anything Alice does in order to achieve this great performance. So that might suggest that the most difficult learning environment would be high stakes, random, and completely indifferent to agents. To summarize, we've proven the optimality of an algorithm called follow the regularized leader. In terms of lessons, we see that regularized leaders are slower, which is bad, but they're easy to follow, which is good. In the long term, diversity converges to seeing the future through regularization. And treating the grass as greener on the other side is actually optimal because it promotes more early exploration. Now, applications of this algorithm include online and stochastic gradient descent, the existence of Nash equilibria, von Neumann's minimax theorem, and strong linear program duality. We can also use FTRL for adaptive boosting and allocating portfolios. Finally, a lot of companies use FTRL or similar systems to learn content preferences for users. I want to thank Dr. Yang Kai at Yale, as well as other resources, for teaching me about this interesting algorithm. I thank Desmos for their useful graphing software. I thank the organizers of the Summer of Math Exposition, including the members of the Discord, for their guidelines and feedback. And of course, thank you for watching. If you have any thoughts or questions, I'd love to hear it in the comments. And as a reminder, a more rigorous treatment is in the description and the pinned comment. I hope you have a wonderful day.